Bible reading today is from Ruth 1, 6 through 18. Uh, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as he has dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that your, you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in the, my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have have a husband this night and should bear sons. Would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi said she was, saw she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Amen. Amen. We are in our second week of our expository sermon series called and on focused on the book of Ruth. Um, like I said last week, uh, this is a different series than others because it is not topical. It is not textual. It is expository, meaning it's going to be focusing on reading the Bible and studying the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And therefore I will give you one minute and then I'll pray for us, but I want to give you a minute to either grab a physical Bible, your actual Bible, or open up your Bible app if that is your primary Bible reading tool. Because I, I, there is no way uh, for you to feel the gravity and to follow along um, with the weight of today's message if you're not looking at the actual text. So would you please grab a Bible or open up your Bible app so we can look at the Word together so that we can hear from the Lord directly together from his word and not from slides or anything like that. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to, to grab that. And, uh, and let me pray for us as well, okay? Heavenly Father, um, it is hard at times to focus on the word of God, especially when we're at home and uh, we're in our rooms, if we have a room. It's difficult sometimes to devote all of our focus and our attention on a, a electrical multimedia device, knowing that there are so many other things we can do while watching, while listening. Maybe some of us feel like just sitting there listening to the preaching and teaching of God's word is not the best use of our time. Maybe some of us multitask for that reason while we're in this space and time, but because your word is most present and most clearly present, particularly in this series, as we read your word verse by verse and chapter by chapter, would you redirect our hearts as Minister Josh uh, commissioned us to do so earlier today to really focus in and lean and press into this moment and just offer and give to you um, 30, the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes so that we can maximize um, this time. We can really use the best, we can best use this time to your glory and for actually our good, that it is more good for us to focus on just your, your word than, than for us to multitask and do other stuff and get stuff done while we're sitting under the word. So help us to take seriously and earnestly and sincerely your word so that we can hear your voice, we can know your truth, and that we can worship you in return. Thank you, Father, for gathering us here um, safely, I pray and trust, warmly, I pray and trust, be with us and meet us in this space and time as we now enter into the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, if you have a Bible or if you have a Bible app, go to Ruth chapter one, verse six, 
put your finger there and we're going to read verse by verse. But one thing that you need to know before we enter into today's text is in addition to covenants, there is a huge theme in the Old Testament that unifies a lot of the Old Testament's writing, why God does what he does, and why people in Israel did what they did as well. And that theme has a Hebrew name primarily, but there are, are lesser English translations of that. That Hebrew word is the word shalom. It can be translated into English as rest, peace, completeness, um, or a combination of the three, holistic peace and rest, eternal rest, sometimes it could be called. The idea of shalom comes from Genesis chapter one, when God, after six days of exerting his creative energy and power into existence and in creating existence in many ways, as we know it, on the seventh day, God performed. God did a proactive thing, not a passive thing. He performed shalom or deep eternal rest. That's why the seventh day doesn't have a morning and evening. There is no end to that day. Shalom is the thing that God proactively performs on the seventh day to celebrate all that he had done for the first six days and to indulge and delight in all of his work performed during the first six days. And that, for that reason, the seventh day, and only that seventh day, the day when God proactively shalomed, did God declare us holy. And so when he invites Israel and his people to experience life as he is intended and designed, he tells them through the Ten Commandments that it is actually a ten, one of the Ten Commandments. It is vital for you and I to also experience shalom. One day we will all experience shalom as it is true, as it truly is in heaven. And that's what heaven is. It's eternal shalom, eternal rest with God. But God wanted us to get a, a teaspoon of that, a preview of that each and every week. And so that's the commandment, honor the Sabbath day. The, the Shabbat or the Sabbath was a day in which we were, God has called us to delight and indulge and enjoy our first six days worth of work and, and our, you know, if you're a farmer, your crops and um, your labor, if you're an architect, if you're a painter, enjoy your first, the work you performed in the first six days. But more important than that, indulge and enjoy in the work of God during those six days. And that's why the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, Sabbath uh, worship doesn't consist of just watching a bunch of movies and vegging out. That's not Sabbath rest. The biblical Sabbath rest is actively, proactively tasting shalom through reading and studying and sitting under uh, the promises of God, the good news of Jesus. The Sabbath rest, shalom, is experienced through worshiping and music and in song, joyfully, all the things that God has done, that all creatures here below uh, praise and point to the goodness and glory of God. And that's what Shabbat, that's what Sabbath is. It is a preview of ultimate rest, shalom. And in fact, that's why we pray, and that's why we gather together to do that too. That's why we confess our sins, and that's why we have a, a prayer of assurance as well, because that's where our shalom comes from. We're being reminded that our true rest doesn't come from anything we do on this earth for the first six days of the week, but it comes ultimately through the work of God and the work of Christ, not only in the first six days of our week, but throughout the entire course of our lives. And certainly as Christians through the gospel. And that is necessary. Knowing what shalom is and the importance and significance of shalom is necessary to understand not only the heart of Naomi, but to see that Naomi more than, mm, she's up there, I want to say more than anyone else, really is one of the most relatable characters in the entire Bible. And every single one of us should be identifying with Naomi. Here's what I mean, okay? Let's go to verse six. Then she, that's Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Now, there's a similar law in, 
Israel at the time, as there was here in Moab, where as a farmer, if you own a plot of land and you have grains, you were to reserve a tenth of that field so that um, the community, particularly widows, those who are homeless, those who are ceremonially unclean can come and harvest from your field. And that would be your tithe uh, in obedience to God or your gods and goddesses for Moabites in uh, honoring and supporting and um, sustaining your community, right? And so what does Naomi, a new widow, elderly widow, do to sustain herself? Well, she goes to the fields. And so as she's harvesting fields from the 10% left in Moab, uh, she is hearing through the grapevine and through gossip and different people sharing information there that God had ended the famine that we read about in chapter one, verses one, that originally led Elimelech to take his family and peace out from Israel, to sojourn from Israel into Moab, the most backwater, most kind of, as an Israelite, disgusting backwater, redneck kind of icky place created out of an incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughters. So she is hearing that God has ended the famine that caused Elimelech to leave Israel in the first place. And notice that it's important to note that it, for her, from her perspective, it, it doesn't say that the famine ended. It says in verse six that the Lord had visited. So Naomi decides to go back to Israel, to go back to Judah knowing that the famine has ended. So in, me in many ways, Naomi is doing what Elimelech should have done in the first five verses of our story, but, but refused to do. Remember Elimelech coming out of Judah and going into the most backwater, most non-Israelite, anti-Israelite, anti-Hebrew place that one could go. He is essentially, in doing that, he's essentially selling out his faith in God, his his. Um, trust and reliability with his community. And he's abandoning everybody to start this new non-Hebrew, non-faithful life in Moab. And so Naomi seems to know that that was wrong. And that for that reason, she doesn't want to stay in Moab, although she could because there's food and there's immediate resources there. Clearly, she knows that maybe that wasn't the best decision. decision so she decides to go back. But notice that she only decides to go back after she hears that God had lifted the famine. And so here's, here's the first sort of glimpse into why I say Naomi is the most relatable character. Because I, I see myself, I see every single Christian do that all the time. We, we have, there's like a knowledge and an awareness of who God is, but we don't fully lean in and follow in unless there's some kind of affirmation and confirmation. Naomi could have gone back before God lifted the famine. And in fact, she should have gone back because as we see later on, Naomi clearly has faith that God can take away things. He can give famines. He can take them, take them away. He can give husbands and children. He can take them away. She seems to have that sort of general theological awareness of God's capacity. And so she should have gone back anyway, but she only goes back when she hears that God lifts the famine. And so there's this tension in her faith. There's, it's, it's a tension between she knows about God, perhaps ideologically and theologically, but she still wrestles with actually stepping out in faith and following that God. So as the story goes on in verse seven, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now, mind you, that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. As I said last week, there's no one in this time period in the ancient Near East that's more vulnerable and more prone to crime and uh, abuse, exploitation than widows, perhaps young children who are abandoned. But even then, there could be a, a family that could adopt them. But for widows, there's, they're just left on the side. They're kicked to the curb and left to the side of the road. And for her to go back that's a, that's a dangerous thing. That, it's, it's dangerous traveling alone as an elderly woman and a widow in this time as it is today, right? But more so during this time. But it's even more dangerous for her daughters-in-law to follow her because they are Moabite women. They're not Judean Israelite women. And so 
in verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, don't come with me. Go to the land, go return each of you to her mother's house and may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She's saying, this is, is dangerous in general to travel period from one country to another, one region to another. But the fact that you are Moabites going to Israel means you're going you're to be completely outcasted and ashamed. So don't, don't follow me. Don't, this is a dumb idea. You're risking your life. You're risking everything you have. If you stay in Moab, uh, things could work out better for you. So just stay. She says, just stay. But in doing that, not only does, you know, she's speaking logical sense here, but not only that, in verse 9, she reveals something profound in, in her heart, about her heart. She reveals where her ultimate shalom is as the reason why it's safer for them not to follow her. Because in verse 9, Naomi, Naomi says, the Lord grant that you may find rest. Shalom, each of you, where? In the arms of the God who gives and takes away? In the hands of the God who created you? In the covenant faithful God of Israel? No. No, he says, may you find shalom, each of you in the house of her husband. She says, don't come with me. It's dangerous to go back anyways. Plus, you guys are Moabites. It's going to be dangerous for you to, as a Moabite person to live in Israel and Judah. But even more important than that, the reason Naomi says don't follow me is because if you want true shalom, well, you're going to need to find it in the arms of a husband. In other words, for Naomi, although her true rest and peace should have come from the God her, the, her God, her covenant faithful God, the God who does give and take away, the God who's in control of all things, her actual shalom was placed in something much lesser than that. It was placed in family. She sought and pursued ultimate rest and peace in her heart, completeness in her life, not in God, the God of shalom, who actually created shalom, who performed shalom eternally, but in the shalom that she could create for herself on earth through a husband, through a nice, uh, through, through a couple of kids, a nice house, maybe a car or two, a, a nice, comfortable life. And it's for that reason she says, don't follow me. In addition to all the dangers that are implied in traveling with me to Judah, ultimately don't come because from her perspective, true shalom comes from your earthly possessions and earthly relationships. Do you see why I say that Naomi is literally like the most relatable person in the Bible? Well, after saying that, verse 10, and they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. Um, they hear the dangers and they're like, no, no, we get that, we get that, but it's okay. We're willing to... We're willing to risk the travel and we're willing to learn Judean Israelite ways. That's fine. And then what does she say in return? She says in verse 11, but Naomi said, no, no, no. Turn back, my daughters. Why will you, and she doubles down on this. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait 18 years till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying for 18 years? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. What is, again, her double-down logic? Why, why does she keep pushing back on Orpah and Ruth following her back to Judah. She's not concerned about the actual physical dangers of that or the cultural danger of that. She keeps on focusing on what? Husband, family, marriage, nice house, cool kitchen, couple of cars. She keeps focusing on that and says, there, it doesn't make sense that you would follow me because I can't provide 
that shalom for you. And so she's incredibly bitter in her heart. Mind you also that what that means is she not only uh, is confessing and double downing on, on what her shalom is, but she's also revealing it by expressing her bitterness. She's also revealing that um, the, the cause of losing her shalom is this God, this God of Judah, this God of Israel, this Lord of Israel. And so in, in some ways, what Naomi is also saying is, if you follow me back to Judah, I don't know what this bully of a God is going to do for you. It kind of sounds like Eve, you know, when, when Eve is like, tells the serpent, no, God didn't only just say, don't eat from the tree. He said, don't touch it. She, her perspective was that God was a big bully. And in the same way, she's like, God, I don't know what this, this bully of a God can do. He's all powerful. He's got all, he's got all authority and he doesn't care about us. Why would he care about you? He doesn't even care about me. And I'm an Israelite and, and you're a Moabite. You think God's going to care about you? I don't know what this God's going to do to you. And her bitterness reveals not only again, that her Shalom was not in the creator of Shalom, but in family and possessions and earthly relationships but her bitterness also reveals her broken understanding of who God is. And so in verse 14, they lifted up their voices and wept again, because this is a hard situation. She's making a lot of good points here, right? And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went on her way. Orpah understands what Naomi is saying, and Orpah agrees. And so she says, all right. But Ruth clung to her. Verse 15, and Ruth said, or rather Naomi said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Have I not been making sense to you? Do you not understand what I'm saying? You, there's no way to find shalom if you follow me. Because remember, shalom comes from having a sweet relationship, marrying the most gorgeous person, dating the hottest person you can find having a beautiful family, your kids going to Harvard and you having a nice house, with, you know, a couple of cars, again, a nice yard. Don't you understand? You can't find Shalom if you follow me. And what does Ruth say? Verse 16. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. I'm willing to abandon everything to cling to you, Naomi, is what Ruth is saying. And why am I willing to do that? Well, verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if Anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Why is Ruth willing to risk her life physically to travel back with Naomi, risk uh, being completely ostracized and treated as a social pariah, made fun of, um, the blunt of racism, exploitation? Why is Ruth willing to abandon all of her uh, Moabite gods and, and systems of theology, because verse 17 reveals it pretty clear. She's willing to even die to cling to Naomi because this God, this God of Judah, not the God of Moab, but the God of Judah has become her Lord. Because even though Naomi's definition of shalom is in earthly things, Ruth through the course of time of living, perhaps in living with Naomi and through the course of God working in her life, Ruth has found ultimate shalom in God, the God of Israel. And it's out of her faith in that God and her obedience to that God that she's willing to risk everything she has, everything she is, to cling to Naomi and to make sure she safely gets back to where she belongs. Thank the Lord that Naomi ha 
has a Ruth to cling to her, even though Naomi is letting go of everything. She's letting go of all the relationships in her life. She's even letting go of her knowledge of who God is, even though she's confused and conflicted. She, she's found ultimate shalom in earthly, temporary things, even though she's a broken person. Ruth, out of faith and obedience to God, clings to Naomi. And as you continue to read the story, it's because Ruth clung to Naomi and wouldn't let her go and wouldn't let Naomi enter and just be lost in her bitterness and in the destruction because Ruth clung to her. That's how Naomi is saved by the end of the story. And that's how Naomi is redeemed by the end of the story. And that's why in Matthew 1, when we read about the people who contributed covenantally to the birth of Jesus, you see a few names of a few women, one of which is Ruth, because there is a truer and better Ruth who does what Ruth does in this story to people like Naomi, people like you and me, who is that truer and better Ruth, but Jesus Christ, who out of his faith and obedience, perfect to God, clung and clings to you and to me, who like Naomi, always find ourselves giving ourselves to so many other things than to God himself who find ultimate peace and rest and completion and all these lesser things than in the ultimate thing himself. What is our hope? What salvation do we have? People like you and me who are like Naomi's, who constantly put our trust and our ambition in all this temporary junk. We need a Ruth to cling to us, to help us, to save us from ourselves. And that's what we have in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have a truer and better Ruth, who not at the risk of his life, Ruth risked her life, but she didn't lose it, who not at the risk of his life, but at the cost of his life, saved us from our sins. So that, so that we could find ultimate Shalom, true shalom, true peace, true rest, not in earthly things and earthly relationships, as good as they might be, but in the ultimate thing itself, not in creation, but in the creator, in God himself. And so the first application is, if you are lost in a world of your own self-created shaloms like Naomi. If you think that getting perfect grades, you think that having a perfect family, getting to that perfect college, having this perfectly nicely orchestrated life is going to bring you peace, harmony, completion, well, you're just like Naomi. And guess what? If your hope is in a, in a relationship, in a beautiful person and being with a gorgeous, hot looking spouse, well, guess what? Um, gravity wins. Time always takes its toll. And it's a matter of time until we... They'll, what is beautiful and hot becomes just pudgy and becomes like every, everything else you see out there, right? Uh, you find the best job there is and, and you start working and you're like, this is amazing. And eventually it becomes work. It becomes labor, right? You have a nice, awesome family, but it's not, uh, they're not good enough. They're not beautiful enough. You're not doing enough. You find a nice, good house. It's not big enough. You have a nice car. Well, it's not nice enough. It's not new enough. Just look at how many times we want to upgrade our phones. Oh, it's a nice phone. You don't need to upgrade it, but it's not new enough. It's not a new enough laptop. The list goes on and on and on of how we, like Naomi, try to find shalom, that eternal sense of rest here on earth through all these earthly things. When Christ went to that cross to save us from these temporary things, and to bring us into that which is eternal, eternally good. And so if you've not received Jesus, if you've not followed Jesus to, to the cross and beyond, to shalom, true shalom, well, this morning by faith, would you do that? But the second sort of lesson and application here is the audacity of Ruth's conversion. Notice um, this language here in verse 14, 
And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and left. But Ruth clung to her. That word is a really unique word. And, and it doesn't appear too often. But I tell you what, it appears in one profound place in the New Testament. It's when Jesus resurrects from the dead and Mary is in searching for the body of Jesus at the tomb of Christ. There is no body. She weeps. And in her tears, she mistakens the resurrected Jesus as a gardener. And then Jesus calls out her name. Mary turns to him. And what does she do? She clings. So hard, in fact, that Jesus says, hey, you got work to do. Don't think. True faithful conversion, my friends, is, is not easy. And this is maybe something for all of us to hear this morning. True faith in Christ radically changes everything. It could cost you everything. And in fact, it, it actually does. You can't be someone who finds shalom in the earthly things and still expect to find shalom in the heavenly things. That doesn't, Jesus says you can't do that. It's like serving two masters. True conversion requires sometimes great sacrifice, like Ruth. Knowing that Jesus Christ, the true and better Ruth, went to the cross to secure for you and I infinite eternal shalom, what that empowers us to do is to confess our love and faith in Jesus, just as Ruth does to Naomi. It allows us to be able to say to Jesus, to say to God, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. What you call me to, I will go. What you want me to say, I will say. I'm going to date who you want me to date. I'm going to spend my money the way you want me to spend my money. I'm going to go to the college you want me to go to. I'm going to major in what you want me to major in. I want to handle my anger the way you want me to handle my anger. I want to handle my lust and deal with my uh, sexual uh, desires the way you desire me to, and you call me to deal with them. I want to look at what you want me to look at on the internet. I want to watch as much media as you want me to watch. I want to listen to what you want me to listen. Do you see the point here? Faith, true faith, saving faith oftentimes is radical. It changes everything in your life. And, and the reality is actually it needs to. It should. Because if, if Ruth was sort of like... It, if Ruth was any less Ruth in her commitment to Naomi, she would be like Orpah. And when things get difficult, she would peace out. But, but that's not what Ruth does. That's not what Jesus does. While even you or and I were sinners, Christ died for us. And so because of that truth, our faith in Jesus sometimes warrants that we put to death certain things and let go of certain things that we're trying to find earthly rest in, that we're trying to find lesser shalom in so that we can experience true shalom in Christ. It could be a myriad of things, but I trust that if you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what am I putting my earth, where am I truly finding shalom in? Well, just ask yourself, like Naomi, what, what would you do if that thing was taken away? Let me close with this. I think it's a powerful illustration that Tim Keller once used. He said, if there's four people at a table drinking wine, how do you find out who's the alcoholic? You take away the wine. And the person who becomes bitter, that's the person who has the addiction. You're not addicted to your phone? All right, what happens if you take it away? Oh, you're not addicted to media? Well, what happens if you take it away? There are a myriad of things that we try to find shalom in. And if you need help discerning what those are, ask yourself, what would happen if those are things were taken away? But know this, know this, no source of your earthly shalom will ever do what Ruth has done for Naomi. No source of earthly shalom will ever do what Christ has done for you. So with that, why don't we respond in musical worship as we seek Christ, the giver, uh, the gracious giver of true.